That's why I think that, you know, our guys racing side by side and being able to do it without wrecking one another is important, obviously. Um, that should be the entertainment. Hi, I'm Kip Childress, and this is the Derek Pernasiglio Show. Can I drive you? Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Derek Pernasiglio Show. Yeah, it's the guy with the long last name, but the guest is the most important part of this show, and we have Kip Childress from the Cars Tour that's here. You and I have worked together for many years uh, over the, the decades. Actually, we, it is decades now. It is, oh my yeah, God. that's right. That's fu funny because uh, we talked in the car on the way over. 2008 is when I first started working with you uh, doing the pit reporting yep. for the East Series, which was then Camping World East Series. That's right. Yep. So, yeah. How you been? How's everything going? It's been busy. It's uh, But a good busy, right? I mean, when you're when you're doing something that you love to do it, and it occupies your time, it's uh, – it's, it's a good kind of busy, and we've been hard at it here the last few weeks. Like, what have you been up to doing? Because I know you took the new position with the Cars Tour. You were with the Cup Series, and we're going to we're gonna get back to that. But what have you been up to? Yeah, so, you know, what I found out is then uh, coming back to the Cars Tour or coming to the Cars Tour after being a part of the Cup Series is all of the things that you have to do to get ready to go to a racetrack still occurs. So when when you're working with the Cup Series, you have so many people in so many different departments that handle a lot of those things. Um, at the Cars Tour, there are three of us. And, um, you know, I, I, I will say that um, I've had to relearn a lot of those things, but I've also had the good fortune to be able to lean on, you know, the, the folks that we have in place there that um, I inherited when I when I came over to the Cars Tour that have, uh, man, if they're not there, we, uh, we, we're we going to struggle. So I'm thankful to have the, the staff that we do. That's great. Uh, and obviously, uh, if there's three employees, <laughs> they all have to be an everything guy or girl, right? I well, say. that's right. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> Keely Dubitsky is our director of operations. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, when I met Keely, she was, um, she was a jack of all trades. I mean, to your point, she can do it all. And so what we've really tried to do is go in and, and kind of help focus her efforts in things on the operation side of what we do. Uh, and that way she doesn't have to worry so much about the competition elements that, that we have going on. And, and that can be, you know, more my responsibility. So that I think what that's been enabled her to do is, is really do a lot of those operationally uh, items better because um, she's able to focus on just those. And then we brought on uh, Carson Elledge uh, as, a, as a full-time employee. And, and Carson handles uh, everything from our uh, merchandising that, that we sell at the racetracks to uh, social posts, uh, press releases, things of that nature. So, um, And then she's another one that it, she steps up when if there are things that need to be done. Uh, she and Keeley, they're, they're quite the duo to, to knock things out before we get to a racetrack. And you need that for – operating a series like this because it's not like it's driven by nascar which is what you've been used to i mean you were in in the cup series for the last what five six seven years now yeah so so cup series from 2019 up until july of last year and um you know everything that you don't think of that fans that teams that even you know track operators sometimes they don't think of uh, from you know membership you know there's a whole department in daytona that handles membership for nascar and, and that is not a large department. And when you think about all of the folks that they do handle um, when it comes to their licensing and, and getting ready to, to go, especially at the start of the year, they are that's probably the busiest department in auto racing uh, from December to, to early February. So we had to do that. And, and you know, we've, we've got some good partners that we work with, um, uh, Frank Bolter and and his Pit Pay app, you know they uh, they help us out a ton, um, but it's still the the you know, the the effort of of reaching out to folks, letting them know where to go, and then processing all of that and make sure that we have everyone's waiver signed, everyone's license fee collected. All of that has to occur, you know, before we show up to a racetrack. And so uh, yeah, thank goodness that Keeley's she's our resident genius when it comes to that and. Uh, and it's really, you know, made that part of my life, you know, pretty easy. Uh, so that's, it's a lot of stuff on the logistical side. What is, it's, what is this, what is some of the stuff that you dread that you have to do? Um, I don't know that there's so much what you dread to do, right? What's the most stressful, I should say? Um, 
the stress generally happens when you're already at the track and you have things that occur that you're that you don't plan for. You know, we just you know today the day after we came off of uh, uh, rain showers at North Wilkesboro Speedway. And then there's the constant, you know, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And, and you know, we're asking ourselves that at the same time that the competitors are asking us. And I always get tickled at, you know, when a, when a team or, or someone calls you up and they're asking you, hey, what are we going to do if it rains? Well, you know, it, it, all, it, it depends. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there are multiple plan B, C's, D's, you know, on down the alphabet. But none of those come into play until the rain stops. And so, and you, know, you have all those in your hip pocket and, and, but the stress part comes when you're trying to make the right decisions, you know, you're trying to make decisions based off of, you know, how does it benefit or hurt the racer? How does it benefit or hurt our partners? How does it benefit or hurt the track? Well, you're also making decisions off of what you can't predict, which is the weather, yeah. you know, and that's the one thing that is not, well, one of the few things that is not predictable in the sport. That's right. And, and uh, I, I know I felt so bad for you guys yesterday because I was looking at the clock and I saw that the post thing came up with the, the race being canceled. And I know you guys had been up there for the last two days. So, yeah. And, and I know you, you always try to squeeze the show in and, and get, get the job done. But you know, um, earlier in the year when we had races scheduled at Southern national speedway and at, um, Jacksonville's, uh, all American speedway, new river, all American speedway, we were able to get out ahead of the weather, um, and make announcements early enough in the week that teams could shift. They could uh, maybe cancel some hotels or, or whatever the case may be there. Um, When we are in conjunction with uh, NASCAR events, when you're running that North Wilkesboro, part of their all-star weekend, it's not as easy to make that shift early. So you do, you try to stick it out. You try to, to bear down and get it done and, and especially once you get everybody parked, you do everything you can to race before you have to leave. And, you know, making that final decision last night that we were going to have to, uh, to, to cancel or postpone was, it was not one that we wanted to make. Um, but you know, we have to, based on the information that we had, you know, looking at a radar and watching all of it come across the mountains, right. uh, you know, from Tennessee, right into North Carolina, we were in constant communication with the Weather Bureau in Blacksburg. We were, you know, all of the information that, and, and fortunately, you know, being at an event that at North Wilkesboro Speedway, that Speedway Motorsports is promoting that, you know, they have all their resources that they're gathering information from too. So you hope that you're making the right decisions based on all the information that you're gathering, but there's still that unknown. Yeah, well, that and also... You never make everyone happy. Well, you don't. Because I saw no. people complaining on social media last night yeah. and, and all that. And I feel for you because I moved into a position of management in a way over at uh, Mountain Creek Speedway, being the communications manager over right. there. And it, just, it is a thankless job because it is a very tough customer base to keep happy. Well, and it's, you know, it's, it, you know, our competitors, that customer base, the fans, there's that customer base, um, you know, and then our, our sponsors there, you know, we, we, they're customers of ours in a roundabout way too. So you, you're trying to do everything to, you know, to make it hurt less on, on all of those fronts and you just can't do it. It, it never, and we tell folks this all the time, nobody wins when it rains, you know, the track, they were, they were going to take a hit on the fan attendance on the front gate. Um, the teams, obviously, they had a lot invested in showing up in the tire purchases, in the fuel purchases, in, you know, pit passes. Now, a lot of those things we'll be able to carry over when we do reschedule, mm-hmm. um, but there will be some that Mandy just can't do it. And so, um, you know, and, and even our staff and, and the car store, you know, I still, you know, our guys had to be, you know, our weekend warriors, our officials, you know, we're, we still have to pay them for their, you know, two and a half, three days of work and, you know, I felt bad for those guys. They, over the course of two days in the rain, inspected over 170 race cars when you, wow. when you factor running everybody through twice. Wow. And so, you know, I, I understand the frustration from the teams. I, I truly do. But we have those as well. And, you know, I, I, I just want, I want everyone to realize that, man, just nobody wins when it rains. 
Are you enjoying what you're doing now? Absolutely. It's, okay. you know, the, the fun part. And, and so when, when we all sat down and started talking about, you know, uh, coming on board and it made me go back and think of those Canaan days, you know, when you and I were there in the, in the 09 and 10 and 11. And so I rem, I remember the, you know, the, the satisfaction that you get when you, when you are faced with a challenge and then you're able to overcome that, that part's fun. You know, um, the, the other fun part about it, and you and I've talked about this a number of times is, is to see the competitors that are in our series. Um, same holds true with, with K and N from, from back in the day, you know, we had so many drivers that in 09, 10, 11, 12, that we talk about now racing on Sunday I know, and, and are racing well on Sunday and look at, and go right on down the line. I mean, think about it, you know, Larson, Blaney, LaJoy, uh, Bubba Wallace, you yeah. know, Moffitt who became a truck series champion to Benedetto. I mean, they, just, they've all, you know, Chase Elliott made yeah. that path down through the, the Canaan series. So, I mean, that's, you know, and you hope that you, you maybe had an opportunity to, to make, some sort of difference on their career that has helped them along the line. So, so coming back to uh, the grassroots level of racing with the cars tour, that kind of re-energized me there. And so, um, you know, to see these guys and gals uh, succeed and do really, really well. And, you know, I know they may not know this right away, but I know that there's going to be a Sunday afternoon where we're going to be talking about them too. Now, what, made you want to go back and work with the cars tour. I mean, cause you're <laughs> working in the NASCAR cup series, the yeah. highest level of American stock car racing. Why go back and do short track stuff? So I'll be honest with you when, when the word got to me that, you know, when Dale and Kevin and, and Jeff and Justin were, were looking for someone to come and be a part of the tour. Um, it, my immediate response was, you know, yeah, I, I love what I do. You know, at at the cup level, I get to work with the greatest racers in the world, in my opinion. Um, you know, and, and not only just the drivers, man, it's the teams, it's the crew chiefs, it's the truck drivers, it's right. all of the officials. It's 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 it, a garage full of amazing people. Absolutely. Yeah, and you know. and then the top all, you know, so I managed the garage. If it moved in the garage, I had my hands on it. Um, and you know, that part was extremely satisfying. And then you go to Sunday and I get to drive the pace car. So I loved what I did. But then when I, I had to remind myself that, you know, anytime an opportunity is presented to you, slow down and take a, take a minute to take a look at it um, and, and really analyze it. Right. Not just, not just look at it for, you know, on the surface of what it is, you know, it's the cup level or it's the cars tour level. All right. It's, it's, no secret that those are two different levels of, of our sport. Um, but really look at all, all that goes into that. So, you know, personally for me, um, I don't have to get on an airplane anymore. You know, <laughs> I don't have to go to the 38 races a year. I, you know, we've got 18 on our schedule. Um, you know, like, like I, we've already talked about, it's quite a bit busier. Um, you know, but that's okay. I mean, because those things, the things I'm relearning from Keely and Carson and, and Jack McNelly, Jack, you know, was the owner of the Cars Tour for a number of years. He's mm -hmm. still a part of our group. So, you know, the thing I learned from 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 them um, and then the fact that I'm able to go home every night, you know, only a handful of tracks we even go to do I stay in a hotel. More often than not, uh, you know, after our Friday practice sessions, I go home and then come back on Saturday morning. And so, you know, there's this, uh, the only, I told, uh, I told Dale this, I said, there's you know, something about being able to go and be in your bed in your house. Well, sure. And I told him, I said, the only thing that would have made this any cooler is if it would have happened 20 years ago. So I could have, <laughs> I could have had that 20 years with my kids. Yeah. So, you know, that, and I think a lot of that is lost on, on the fan and they don't, they don't realize how much time and that is spent away. Um, you know, even though, you know, the, as an even as an official, we were able to, you know, to fly out. We were we were all on a charter flight if we were in the Charlotte area. So fly out on a Thursday or Friday and fly back Saturday or Saturday or Sunday night. So you're back at home. But man, when you do it every weekend, you know, now to be able to be home every night um, 
and and it 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 did come at a great time because now my oldest daughter's expecting so our first grandchild's on the way in September. I was just so just going to bring that up. So it 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 this did come at a great time, and I, and I've often said that you know things happen for a reason. The timeline we may not agree with, we may not understand, but mm. at the end of the day, most things tend to pan out pretty well for it if you'll just slow back and, and trust the process. So now you uh, are, are going to be a grandfather soon. Yep. Um, are there things that you're looking at now, like opportunities to do with the grandbabies that you didn't get to do with your kids when you were on the road? Oh, wow. Yeah, you know, so I I don't know yet. Um, <laughs> I just, I think the part, the part that I'm looking uh, most forward to is just the opportunity to be present. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. And take them to a couple of races here and there to see what grandpa yeah, does. Well, for sure. Right. <laughs> so, um, so it is funny, you know, I have two daughters. Uh, Sarah is my oldest daughter and then Brianna, my youngest daughter. You know, Sarah is, uh, she's been married now for a little over a year and, uh, she and, and her husband, Josh, they've, they've been together for the last seven years. And so, I mean, they've, they've been family even, even before they were, they were officially family and, and so, but they're, man, they're living life and, and they're, they're, it's just as a dad to sit back and look at your kids doing their thing. It's just amazing to think that it's that, that amount of time has flown by. And then, you know, my youngest daughter, Brianna, she is, uh, she's in college now. She's uh, bouncing around between a couple of community colleges, taking different classes. Um, she, she uh, started out up at Appalachian state and realized that, um, you know, up there wasn't for her at that time. Um, so she came back home and jumped right back into the community college and she's taken, uh, she's taken a couple of anatomy classes. She's, uh, she's interested in sonography and any of them with an interest in motorsports, not with her. No, really? she, okay. she's not the motorsports kid. My, my, my oldest daughter, Sarah eats, breathes and sleeps it. Right. So she loves to go to the racetrack. She and Josh go all the time. Um, when we're able to, to get everybody together to go. Because um, yeah, because this has been a generational thing for you. Because your grandfather oh, was yeah. an official, your dad was an official, you're an official. Like yeah, and that's what I think is cool about uh, racing is that you don't have to be a driver just to be generational in the sport. Well, that's you, true. Yeah, you know, there's people at ex- people at executive levels, officials, uh, you know, media people, uh, all of them. Yeah, and. Uh, you know, I knew when I was a kid, this is what I wanted to do. And, and I had the ability to tell folks, man, not drive. You didn't like get a little bit of a <laughs> desire to drive a race car. There was an opportunity to, um, to, to get on a go-kart and drive that a little while. Uh, we went to, uh, we, there was when well, my dad was working with the, uh, the, what is now the Xfinity series. So at the time it was, you know, the, the Budweiser sportsman series, that became the Bush series. And then, you know, at the early part of their evolution. So we were at Bristol, Tennessee for a race and Ed Whitaker, who lived in the area, he owned cars that Dale Earnhardt drove that Morgan Shepard drove. Mm So um, we were there and, and dad had lined up uh, for me to go and spend time with Ed's kids. And we were going to ride go-karts and man, I was really, man, I was, I was wanting to be a racer. I said, this is what I want to do. I can do this. I want to be a racer. And he stopped me. He said, you know what? He said, I will tell you that being an official is, is better than being a racer. And here's why. Because of all the people that go to a racetrack, the racer is not guaranteed to leave with more money than he came with. If you're an official, <laughs> you know, you're going to leave with more money than you came with. Now you're not going to get rich doing it, but you're not going to be in the negative when you leave either. Right. Unless you, unless you spend too much time at the concession stand. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I always used to tell people to, uh, I moved over to announcing because I could go to the track and make money instead of spend it. Right. So, yeah. But getting back to, you know, y- your roots though, your, your grandfather was, uh, he was an official at Bowman Gray stadium or, uh, yep. yeah, he was yep. the chief steward there, right? Yeah. So, you know, my, my grandfather was there, um, in the, in the sixties as their chief steward. Um, I'll, I'll go back even a little farther than that. Um, you know, we, we talked, you and I talked really, really quickly uh, about that timeline, right? But I, what I failed to mention was Enix Taylor was my great uncle. So Enix, one of Enix's sisters, um, and Enix was the owner of North Wilkesboro Speedway. His sisters ran the ticket department, one of which was my grandmother. Um, and then, so this rain out really had to have been a heartbreaker for yeah, me. Yeah, <laughs> man. It, well, you know, that's what made last year so cool to go back to Wilkesboro. 
Um, but, you know, Enoch was around when they were promoting races, um, you know, back through, you know, at Bowman Gray Stadium, at, you know, Orange Speedway or Oswego, no, uh, with the, uh, Oak, the Okanoche Trail, you know, Dale did his, mm-hmm. his show on Lost Speedways about that. So all of those tracks throughout, you know, the central part of North Carolina and even probably a little in, into western North Carolina, you know, Enoch was a part of the promotion group with Bill France Sr., with Alvin Hawkins, Alvin was the uh, the first promoter at Bowman Gray Stadium, mm-hmm. um, and so my grandfather and it was kind of I think it was probably completely unrelated that he became the you know a chief steward there. Um, he was he was an official there, so you know obviously here comes Dad along, and Dad's around the racetrack all the time at Bowman Gray, and I, I'm not sure what piqued his interest of being an official. You know, Dad never drove a race car. My now my grandfather owned a couple cars that he also had to be an official of, which I thought was kind of interesting. But um, you know, Dad, when he my earliest memory of him being an official, he was already at the NASCAR level on the, you know, on the management side of things. You know, he was part of the group that helped manage the weekly racing. Um and then that like it where the now Xfinity series kind of came from out of the weekly racing ranks right out of late model racing that's right yeah. and so in, in 82 when that when that got started up to be the budweiser sportsman series dad was was a part of that even before that though he was a part of the dash series back when it was the baby grands in the mid 70s right you know so i can remember going to all of those races it's really kind of cool now and it, that just happened to remember dean combs dean was one of the multi-time champions at the baby grand dash series level right you know, and now we see Dean at the car store races. So things have really gone full circle with, with guys like him. But, um, but you know, you know, dad worked for NASCAR from the time that really I was born up until I think 83 was his last year. Mm-hmm. Um, he had an opportunity to, to go and work in the offices down in Daytona. We were all going to pack up and move to Daytona and it was a, almost a done deal. And, and then, you know, something happened. I'm not sure, you know, there was a, uh, he ended up coming back home and it just, it just wasn't what he was, I guess, picturing or anticipating or whatever the case may be. So, you know, in 83, he, it's he, Florida, you got to adjust this. Well, some people like Florida, some people don't, but he stepped yeah. away from it. Uh, man, as a kid, I was so mad because, uh-huh. you know, here I was going to the racetrack and I had free run of the place because my dad was in charge. And, mm-hmm. and so, so at any rate, you know, here I was 12, 13 years old. I still wanted to be a part of the racing world. Right. So, you know, dad stepped away for a number of years. He actually um, started the fire extinguisher business locally, but went to work with uh, uh, a, a brand called Halonite. Halonite made a fire extinguisher and, and one of dad's um, first drivers at it because he wanted to make an onboard system. One of the first drivers he got hooked up with, with was Tony Siscone. And Tony ran the, he ran the logo on the car. He helped dad with promotional deals up, you know, up in New England. Was this before or after Tony got burned? This was after. Okay. Yeah. So okay. this was a, it, that's what kind of made it a, a big deal. Right. So, mm-hmm. so at any rate, um, you know, dad stayed in racing through that avenue. Of course, the Staley family, we were all related. Every time that North Wilkesboro had an event, dad and I would go and we, even as a kid, I would go and work. I would pass out brochures or hang banners or whatever, whatever odd job I could find to do. And, um, but we would, and as I got older, we, we kind of, uh, became, you know, part of that operations team there. Um, and then, you know, dad was the race director at Caraway Speedway for a number of years at Tri-County Speedway for a number of years. And I would tag along there too. And, and then I guess it was probably 92, 93 is when I got my, my start of being an official mm-hmm. uh, after, after tagging along at and Caraway at Caraway. Okay. Yeah. But so my first job there was, I was a, Backup public address announcer. The the PA guy there, his name was Jim Purdy. Jim had been there forever, but Jim was getting on up there in age. And and so uh, Russell Hackett's idea was to bring on a, a backup announcer. I had I had been a little bit of a, of a PA guy back at the Pop Warner level. And even, even at that point in time, I'd started helping our PA announcer at the high school that I graduated from. So I was I, I just, I love being in front of a microphone for whatever the reason. And you still do it too, right? I, I still, yeah, when we're... It's been like 20-something years you've oh, been announcing it, other sports that aren't racing. That's yeah. right. At, at our at our local high school, you know, where my kids graduated from or my youngest daughter graduated from, I, I still announce basketball during the winter and 
volleyball in the fall and baseball and softball some during the spring. Football's always tough because it's a Friday and I'm typically gone almost Friday. So, um, uh, but yeah, I, I love doing it. So anyway, jumped in there to be a backup announcer and we were at a race one night and the, uh, the pace car came off the racetrack coming to the green. This was the initial start of the race and it was a 200 lap late model race. Um, I don't know what happened to cause this to occur, but as the car came off the banking and it, it hit the transition on the pit road, the pace car, the pace car, mm-hmm. it took a dead left and went straight into the guardrail. <laughs> then it backed up and hit the guardrail again. So I think the throttle hung on it um, <laughs> somehow or another, either the throttle hung on it or maybe, maybe a water bottle got, you know, down under the gas. I don't know what happened, but right. you know, the car was, the car was killed and the driver, um, he was, he was hurt. I mean, broke some ribs. Really? Uh, yeah. I think oh, the yeah. airbag, I think the airbag deployed on the first hit and then on the second hit that had already deflated. So I think he, the second hit probably is what hurt him. But at any rate, the, the, the tower at Caraway back in the day was about a third of the size of the tower they have now. It was a little box mm-hmm. and it was like up on stilts. And so I'm in the back of that with my microphone in my hand, and Dad turns around to me and points at me, and says, "Hey, go find something to drive. You're the new pace car driver." <laughs> so uh, I didn't know what to do. I ran out the back door and I went and I found I don't know if it was a little pickup. I don't. We ended up in a pickup. I think the rest of that night. And Who, whose pickup was it? I don't know. It was it was there at the track. <laughs> I mean, it was you know a track truck or something. But <laughs> finished up the night and then became the pace car driver for the next handful of years there. You didn't get in trouble for swiping somebody's truck? I mean, I no, I don't remember if I did or not. I don't guess I did. Like I said, I think it was probably a track truck that was just there and everybody was kind of scrambling to find something. So here, getting this and go. And how old were you at the time? Um, so that would have been I was probably 22, 23. Okay. Yeah, somewhere around there and and so um uh did that for a number of years at Caraway, dabbled in a little bit of the inspecting you know, part of went on, but I was more interested in the procedural things that happened. You know, I, my dad had been a race director forever, so I listened to him call races. David Hoots, who called races forever at the NASCAR level, well, David started working for my dad. Um, so I got to grow up around David, another one of the best race directors I've ever heard in my life. Right. And he's still doing it, too, with the, with the, the modified. Sm- smart modified, right? Yeah. Uh, Wayne Alton was another one of the best race directors I've ever heard. Wayne, um, you know, I got to you know work with him, obviously. And he worked with Dad. He and Buster and all the Alton family seemed to work with Dad when, when Dad was working in the, you know, at, at NASCAR in the 80s and 90s. <clears throat> so um, after working a handful of years at Caraway, I decided to start you know, pestering Wayne Alton. He was the truck series director. I, I just, you know, I, I wanted to do something at the traveling level. I wanted to take that next step. And so uh, I pestered Wayne enough that he finally gave me an opportunity to, to, to come late in the, in the season in 95 and be a part of the truck series crew. And um, then 96 went full time with the, the truck series and did that for the next handful of years. Does NASCAR go scouting around for officials like uh, some teams go looking for drivers or they look for talent uh, or do do officials go have to apply? Yeah. So not, they, they don't go scouting around a lot. I I say that, you know, if, if a, if a regional tour visits a racetrack and they spot someone that is just blows their socks off, then maybe, they might say, hey, man, if you're ever interested in doing something. They, I don't think they would actively pursue someone. And I feel the same way at the cars tour, cars tour level, right? And, and here's why. The short tracks throughout the country, it's tough to get someone to come and be an official. Yeah. Right? I, I believe, Because you guys got to take a lot of crap. Yep. It, and you do. Being an official is tough. And so – when NASCAR goes and races at these tracks, when we go, when we visit these tracks, um, I, I will not go and start poaching from their officials. Na- and NASCAR doesn't do that either. They, you know, they, they didn't come to me, ask me if I wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and at the same time too, even through the process of them bringing me on board to go work with the truck series, even back in 95, um, you know, we, I sat down with, with Russell Hackett and said, Hey, look, I, you know, this is what I'd like to do. And, you know, I want to, I want to kind of stretch my legs a little bit. And, 
you know, NASCAR didn't want Russell to think that they were actively pursuing, you know, their officials. It's because it's just so tough to find good ones. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, and I, I think they still, I, I know they, they still practice that to this day. And, and that's the reason why I feel the way that I do. If, if, if we have a, a weekly official that wants to come and, and join our staff, you know, if we've got, you know, the ability to bring them on, then we certainly take a look at that. But I, if, 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 if they are working somewhere at a track, I, I will not ask them to step away from that. Um, if I catch wind that maybe they're looking to do something different, we may have a discussion um, you know, but I don't want, you know, I don't want that. I don't want someone to, I don't want a track operator to look at us and think that we're coming in to take someone. Right. Yeah. Right. I know. Like you said, the whole poaching thing. Right. But I tell you what, I give you guys credit because being an official, it, it's a different breed because a lot of it is hearing people yelling at you, being complained to, being, you know. You got to have some pretty thick skin. <laughs> yeah, you got to have skin like an alligator. Yeah. The, yeah. the one thing that I really try to impress on all of our guys, too, is the fact that you have to, you have to take all the emotion completely out of what you do. You mm -hmm. have to sit there and take it. Um, you know, and at the same time, too, you know, we ask all of our competitors to be respectful. Hey, look, I, I understand if you're mad. This is a very passionate sport. If you weren't passionate, when something went wrong, I would probably question why you're doing it. Yeah. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're upset, I, I was officiating a cup race. I was on pit road. We were at Phoenix one year and I don't remember the crew chief, but it was one of the Sabco cars. We were in the middle of the race. They'd gone through some green flag stops and, and man, I wanted to, I want to say it was Scott Eggleston, but I can't remember. But at any rate, they thought they were the leader of the race. And I think they were end up, tail end of the lead lap or something like that. So he comes off the pit box and he's down. Hey, would you have them check score? And I think we ought to be the leader or whatever the case may be. So I called it up and, you know, it was, I believe it was the 42 car. Hey, they, they want you to check their scoring and nope. Sure enough, this is where we got them. He was so mad and he understood I was the messenger, right? But he was so mad. He was in my nose. He was right up on my face. He was, you know, had his finger right in my nose. Yeah. And just letting me have it. And I just stood there and I took it. And I could feel the adrenaline start to, you know, you know, when you get, you know, n nervous or mad and you could feel the heat coming up your neck. Yeah. I had that sensation. I'd never had that before, but I had that sensation. I could feel my eyeballs start to twitch. It was, I was, <laughs> he was, and he was mad. And, and so, but anyway, he finally got out of the system and he got back up on the pit box and I finally just kept telling him, Hey, look, I'm just telling you what is being told to me, right. you know, and, and look, this is, this is, this is what we're going with. This is, this is the, the verdict here. Right. And so he climbed back up on the box and he was mad. I think by the end of the day, they realized that, you know, the scoring was, was correct and they miscalculated on the top of the box or something for the next handful of races. I got an apology every day, man. I'm so <laughs> sorry, man. I'm so sorry, man. I, and right. I'm like, listen, Hey, look, and I, I told him then it's the same philosophy I have now, you know, what happened last week? That was last week. We're all good. You don't have to keep apologizing. I, I, I'm thankful that you did. I appreciate that you did. But, you know, again, you were displaying your passion. I have no problem with that at all, as long as we can be somewhat respectful. When you step over that line of being and, and you become disrespectful, whether it's with your language or whatever the case may be, that's where that conversation ends and I walk away. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I, you, I give you guys a lot of credit because I, it for it, it's hard for me. It's I find it hard to do because for years, you know, being a driver, doing media stuff, you're on one side of a fence. Then when you go into operations or management, you're on another side of the fence. And over here, you're more of a punching bag. It's so yeah, you really are. I, I mean, I don't know how guys do it because I'm finding it difficult with dealing with the. The, the the complaints and the yelling and you know I'll go I'll telling go back you what you should do and yeah I'll, I'll go back to the part part two where I, I've had some pretty good um mentors along the way my my heroes along the way you know and it starts out with my dad um man he had it come from coming at him from all angles um you know the David Hoots the Wayne Altons of the world they they were able to 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 take all of that and be able to stay calm and slow down and process, you know, what needs to be said, what needs to be done. Um, I'll tell you another one that doesn't get enough credit. Um, 
that was actually a big part of me moving over to the Cup Series. Um, man, Jay Fabian was he he could take a, a, a problem and be able to slow down and process that problem, and 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 use extreme common sense and explaining to you how we got to where we got to. And by the time that you know that conversation was over, you 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 felt good about where you left that conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, it's you might you might not be you know might not have gotten your way but now you understand why you didn't get it. Mm-hmm. And, and man, he was just so good at being able to stay calm and cool through that process. Do you think it's more people skills or negotiating skills that makes a, a strong official? Absolutely. Both of those. Which, oh, yeah, both. you got to have them, right? I mean, you, you've, you've got to be able to, I think having the people skills helps me get in front of a microphone uh, at a basketball game and to be able to announce. Okay. Right. Um, and, and especially at the high school level where you're, you know, you've got fans that are all around you that are upset with the officials there too, but they're, you know, you mispronounce a name man. they're all in, uh, right. Yeah. So, uh, I know. so I, I, tr- I go to great lengths to try not to do that, but um, you know, but you're, you're somewhat in the PR department, you know, when you're doing that. And, and as officials, we are too, we're, we're promoting what we do. We're promoting our series. Um, but then you've got to be able to have the, the negotiating skills to be able to, you know, and it's, it's not, Hopefully it's not so much negotiating. Hopefully you're able to explain why we're there and not having to negotiate to meet in the middle um, because, you know, you hope that you've got a set of rules that all you're doing is enforcing them. And then it's, then it's being able to explain those rules. Here's, here's what they say. Here's why they say it. And this is how and why we're enforcing this. Um, if you're having to negotiate, then, then there's almost a part of it where maybe you're not right. And there's, I'll say this. There have been plenty of times that I've been wrong, and I learned a long time ago that um, it's okay to be wrong. And it, but it's it's especially okay to own up to it. You know, raise your hand, man. Yes, I messed up. I we were at a K and N race at Martinsville. Remember when we ran the K and N cars there with the modified tour, yep. and it rained, and we and we had, and the K and N race got shortened up. We posted the finish. And Dale Quarterly and Jeff Anton, I believe, came to the trailer. Man, we feel like we should have been here instead of here in the in the rundown because um, as we were coming on the pit road, um, the two car, Ryan Gifford, didn't maintain his pace, didn't maintain the speed. And we're like, man, it was pouring the rain down. I, I didn't see that. Well, <clears throat> and that was the rule at the time. If you didn't maintain your pace, you blend it back in wherever you blend it back in. As we're coming down pit road, and it was, I hate it for Ryan, but he spun the car out coming down pit road. And so um, Jeff ended up getting around him. I think Dale was his crew chief or whatever. So and Jeff got around him. And and so we got together, you know, at the time, I guess it was Speed that was still broadcasting our stuff. So we we got uh, probably TV Tim to, uh, to pull some footage for us really quickly so we could take a look at it in the trailer. And we were able to identify where the two car spun, where he blended back in and how everything shifted according to that. So when, when Dale and uh, Jeff came to the trailer and they were arguing their point, you know, we listened to them. Then that's the one thing that I always try to do is to listen, you know, Hey, I'm doors always open. If you've got something we need to, so they want to, they want to plead their case. Correct. Mm -hmm. So listen to what they had to say. I said, give me a minute. Let me see what we can do to figure this out. So that's when we got the footage. Uh, Liz Fredrickson was our chief scorer. We brought her down, and and so we we gathered all of our data and we we shifted the lineup to or the the results to reflect the spin on pit road. And the one thing that Dale said to me, he said, "Number one, I never would have believed that you guys would have even listened to, to that argument, much less make a change." And my answer to him was, he, I said, look, I said, you know, there are times where, where we're going to mess up because we're all human. I said, and, and sadly, in the, in the sport that we're in, if you do make a mistake, there's a lot of times you can't correct it. Mm-hmm. You know, the race goes on, and, and by the time you get laps down the road, you can't correct it. It's, or, or correcting it might create other problems. This was an instance where we were able to correct it. And I, like I said, first to raise my hand and say we messed up, and, and we got this fixed. There are things that even even in my short tenure now with the Cars Tour, 
there are things that, you know, we've, we've fallen short of when it comes to whether it's, um, officiating a race, you know, maybe we made a call that, um, we, we, you know, if we just slowed down and been able to think about it, if we had the chance to think about it or, or had maybe had some other data could have made a different decision. And, you know, we, we had one race earlier this year where we didn't have our best nine in the tower. Um, it happens. There are race teams all up down pit road. Don't have their best days. Well, we're expected to be hundred percent every week. And we had one night we weren't. And I've said to the whole crew, that's on us. You know, I, unfortunately I can't fix any of it, but I can just tell you that we will do our damnedest to make sure we don't let that happen again. And so, you know, sat down with our, our staff, we've got, in my opinion, uh, one of the best race directors. Uh, I, I talk about those guys a lot, but it takes a special guy to be able to call races. Danny Willard is our race director. I think he's one of the best in the business. Um, you know, Lee Watson came on board with us this year as our chief scorer. Mm-hmm. Um, Lee does a great job in keeping the cars where they need to be kept. Um, so we sat down and we we came up with a timeline of things that happen during the course of a race, especially when the yellow comes out. You know, the the different processes we go through to take us from – dispatching the pace car right back up to the chews and the green flag. And so since then, knock on wood, we've, <laughs> we've had some, we've had some really good races. And we, we had opportunities at a couple tracks where we know we don't get a lot of cautions to, you know, to have some good races and get our, get our momentum built up. And, and I, and I think we right now we've got a pretty good head of steam that we're, that we're carrying into hopefully our next race. that doesn't get rained out, which will be tri County in a couple of weeks. And that's something different for you guys with the Cars Tour because you have some rules set in place too. Uh, you have uh, a caution every 40 laps. I think that's one of the rules, right? Explain that to the people that are tuning in that don't know all of the race procedures for the Cars Tour. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, we have two different divisions. We have a pro late model and we have our late model stocks. The late model stocks, you know, in this in the central part of, of the East Coast, you know, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, the late model stock car has been around in that area forever. And it seems like that's the, the one area in the, in the country that is mo- the most prevalent. Uh, the pros are, they run everywhere, but we, what we see with our pros is it's where a lot of the younger racers are, are getting their start in a full body uh, stock car. So the pros typically run a hundred laps. Our late model stocks run 125. They're all green laps. We don't count cautions. Mm-hmm. That creates a that can create a challenge if we have a night that doesn't go smooth with a lot of extracurriculars out there uh, from a fuel standpoint. So we're always mindful of that. Um, we do have a competition yellow. If we have in the pros, it's forty laps. If we have forty consecutive green laps at any point during the race, mm-hmm. um, there will be a caution. Um, it's forty five laps for the late model stock cars. And and the reason that I like that, I mean, it, it's it's really kind of funny. There was a a short stint where I was a race director at Orange County Speedway. Um, and we had something very similar to that where we made it consecutive laps. That way that that window of consecutive laps can float throughout the race. So if you have an early caution, say at lap five, then that moves that 45 lap, you know, run to, to lap 50. But don't you think a, a, a race should be organic where if, if an incident happens and the caution comes out, that's it. That's the caution without fabricating cautions, you know, or, or generating cautions to an extent. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also think that at, at our, at our level of racing, uh, well, I mean, there's stage breaks are planned cautions, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's at the top level of racing. So the, the way that we do ours is, is it gives them that opportunity to run a, a long stretch. Um, so, we just feel like at, at our level of racing, you know, there's part of the element that we are entertainment. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you get into a race where um, the the line gets strung out, there's not a whole lot of passing for whatever the case may be, then, then you know, let's re-rack them and go again. The reason that I like the 45 lap or the, or the 40 lap comp yellow is because we're not hiding it. We're not looking for phantom debris. We're not, you know, we're not making something up as we go. Mm-hmm. The teams know right away, and we make the announcement over the radio as we go back to green, you know, competition caution will be at lap whatever if we don't get another yellow. Does that add strategy or take away strategy for your races? Because these guys know when a yellow is coming. 
Yeah, it may, it may, from a tire wear standpoint, it may add some strategy, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, at a track like New River All-American out in Jacksonville and a really, really um, abrasive surface that just chews these tires up and spits them out, you know, maybe it adds strategy there. You know, my first time going there was, was late last summer and to watch those guys race, it was, for me, it was fun. I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm watching a leader come to the front every two or three laps that maybe doesn't lead every, you know, but just that, that, that track. Mm -hmm. And so now you're, I'm sitting there and I'm watching this race unfold. Uh, We finish and and we didn't have, we only had, I think at that race, we had one, you know, yellow for calls. Um, And it was just a little lazy spin. So, but as the race was going on, you're wondering, all right, at what lap, does somebody go at what lap do they take off? And then they're hoping that it sticks. Then they're hoping that they didn't use it up too good, too early. They didn't, and, and they don't have the yellow comes out to foil their plan. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's a certain level of strategy at that. Do you remember there was a Southern modified race at Myrtle beach speedway? God knows way back when <laughs> Gene pack was racing in that race and Gene was on a mission to make a statement at that race because Gene had moved down to Myrtle beach. He was residing down there. I do. I think I remember this. So this race starts up and he takes off. Everybody had already decided they were going to ride, not Gene. He said, I'm going to lap the field and we'll see how it unfolds. And then the Southern modified race, we didn't have any, we didn't have any, you know, planned yellows, anything like that. Right. Well, he takes off and he's gone. Was Bill Hennessy the track operator, or was he the promoter there at the time? I honestly don't remember. All right, so we're sitting up. I'm calling the race. Sherry Clifton's the director at the time, but I'm a race director for the night. Um, And who I, I want to say it was Hennessy, but came up to the tower and said, I can't believe this race. You're letting this race get out of hand. You need to throw a caution. You need to throw a caution. I'm like, hold on. He's on a mission. He's on a plan. I'm not going to be the guy that foils that plan. Yeah. Right. I said, if he, man, just think of the story. If he laps the field and then a yellow comes out, he's won this thing. I mean, this, this think of the storyline behind that, that I just, you know, I to see that unfold would have been cool. Yeah. Well, as luck would have it, um, it didn't happen that way. I think someone lost an engine and because Gene had gone out and, and just blown their doors off for half the race. Now stuff's gone. He's right. used up. Because Myrtle Beach chews up tires like, you any, know, a fat kitty's cake. Yeah, any of those tracks <laughs> that are on the coast, you know, would, would do that. So anyway, to go back to to what we do, but because our teams, because our, our, our guys understand that that's how those cautions are going to come into play, I would say that there's some strategy played around in, in that. You know, they, you know, they, um, we've got some pretty crafty guys that are in the Cars Tour garage. Mm-hmm. And it it's it, it's just like the K and N was man. It it's these guys that are they've they've been to the cup and the Xfinity and the truck level, and they're coming back to the K and N, you know, to help get these young kids ready to to move up. But they're also coming back because of the the schedule being the way that it is, and and because these late model stock cars and these pro lates are cars that they can they can tune, they can massage, they can. You know, the, the rules aren't as strict as, you know, our cars don't go through the OSS. They don't go through a scanning system to, mm-hmm. you know, we've got templates mm-hmm. and we've got measurements that we take, but, you know, it's not to near the degree that they do at the cup level. So these guys come back and, and it gives them a chance to be racers again, right? And that I, I hear this all the time from guys that we had a handful in the garage just, you know, yesterday at North Wilkesboro that they love coming and tinkering with our cars because – you know, the, the box is so tight when you get to the cup level. Yeah, no, I, I get it. You're, you're mandated to a certain set of rules. And plus the the cup cars now are just completely different from what a lot of these guys have been used to working on the, uh, over the years. But what I find really funny in a way is history is repeating itself because when I was in the Kane and pro series, 2009, 2010, you had a lot of, Cup and Xfinity teams or Xfinity crew members that had come down to this level and they were enjoying it because right. they were having that that fun again. Yep. And now here it is again a decade or so le- later, and it's that same feeling in the Cars yep. Tour. 
that uh, that they're doing. Yeah. Is uh, is that one of the reasons why you came back to it? I mean, because when I saw the announcement for you going to the car store, I was like, that's a good choice. Because one thing that I always admired about you is that you were always firm with everybody, but fair. There was never any time that I, I never, ever heard any competitor yell favoritism or anything like that when you were running stuff. Yeah, you know, so all of that comes into play, right? And um, to be able to come back and, and to try, and again, I'll go back to the part where we're trying to get racers ready to move up. Mm. And I think that, you know, the way to do that is to get them used to that firmness, you know, at this level. Um still being mindful that, you know, this is a, a grassroots late model division, late model series. Um, but I think we're, we're, we're giving them the, the direction that they need, the, um, you know, even, even introducing some of the, uh, I don't know the word that I'm looking for, but, you know, kind of the climate that they have as they move up the ladder, you know, um, if we can help them get that now as they do, you know, climb that next rung, Maybe they're a little more prepared for it as they go up. Well, the car tour is also different too because you guys have kids as young as what thirteen years old in in pro late models, right? Or is it younger than that? Pros are twelve. Twelve. Yeah. yeah. Twelve years Tri old. It, so it was in a late model. We were at uh, we were at an autograph session at Hickory last year, and I see Aiden King. Aiden is probably fifty pounds soaking wet. <laughs> He's standing beside of his car and no one's coming up to him to get an autograph. They don't recognize him. Right. But he's standing there and he's got his hero cards in his hand. And I walk up to him. I say, Hey buddy, how's it going? He said, Oh, pretty good. And so we're just sitting there chit chatting a little bit. And a lady walks up to him and says, uh, do you know where the driver is for this car? And I said, ma'am, he's, <laughs> this is him right here. <laughs> she couldn't believe it because he's no bigger than a minute. Right. Um, but such a uh, Aiden and then uh, Tristan McKee is another one that comes to mind. You know, mm -hmm. both of them just little guys, mm -hmm. but man, they're they're fierce behind uh, the wheel of a, of a race car, and they're not just they're not out there bullying people out of the way. They're not driving it like it's a video game. And there's some of that that goes on, but but these two kids, man, they're they're doing a great job with understanding that these are these are real race cars without a reset button. That was the next question that I was going to ask you because we posed this question to a lot of our guests is you've seen many g generations of racing coming from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, you know, drivers getting a, uh, opportunities because they can drive. Uh, and now we're seeing just kids that are younger and younger coming into the sport. What is the urgency to put kids in the highest level of stock car racing? May, you know, so what are some of the earliest photos that you can remember seeing of Jeff Gordon racing or Tony Stewart racing? Being an open wheel guy, I remember him from the sprint car days. Right. And so you remember them being like quarter midgets or micros or whatever. And, but they're little kids and they're, you know, I think that now, I mean, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of an evolution. Um, if you're, you know, you can't be 30 years old getting started in this anymore. You can't be, you can't be Harry Gant and, you know, driving your first race after you're, you know, well into your thirties. You've, you've, if you've, if you've done, I mean, those guys, there are guys now that you know, by the time they get that old, they're already thinking of an exit plan. Right. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, you know, we, we are seeing uh, racers that are, are quite a bit younger um, now. And uh, you know, I, I, I think it's just, I can remember, Canaan days, and I can remember when uh, Chase Elliott was really coming on the scene in his super, and he was 13, 14 years old. And at the Canaan level at that time, he had to be 16 to get to the Canaan series. Mm -hmm. And the discussion popped up during the winter that, hey, do we need to consider moving our age to 15? And, you know, some of the folks that were in the Daytona offices were like, oh, I can't. Or, you know, how are we going to do that? I mean, they're not right. even, they can't even drive a real car, you know, and we're going to have them driving race cars. I'm like, listen, he's, he's driving already. It, and he's, he's Chase Elliott. Everything he touches turns to gold, even at that age, right? He's winning in everything he sits in. 
So he won you, North Wilkesboro back well, in the day. Remember right. in 2010 with the pass race? That's he won right. North Wilkesboro. I interviewed him. So we, yeah. we talked about, look, he's going to be racing somewhere. Why not make it to where he can race with us? Mm-hmm. You know, and obviously Bill and, and Cindy were, were really pushing hard to get him under the NASCAR banner. And, and so, you know, they were able to, to, you know, pull off the changes, you know, during the off season. And so at 15, here comes Chase Elliott. And now did the Elliott family approach NASCAR about lowering the age yeah. or was it NASCAR that came up with lowering the age? I don't, I don't know the timeline on that. I, I will say this, you know, I think, I think the discussion had already been had about, you know, is, is this something we want to, to go, you know, is this the path we want to go down? Right. Um, and I think 15 it, was like, a magic number because even yeah. look because Logano came in at what 16 or 17 and even people were raising their eyebrows about that right uh, you know I think that the timeline though is it probably just ironically matched each matched the each each instance right you know we were you know NASCAR was looking at going down that path anyway and and it just happened to be when when Chase was going to be able to be 15 and come and race in the Canaan series so uh I will say this too, this and this will go back to how tough that series, how tough that division really was. How many races did Chase win at the Canaan level? One. Yeah. That was it. And that, and that wow. was at Iowa, right? Mm-hmm. And that was a combination race, but it was that. So here, here's a kid that comes in and has, at that time, had the support of Hendrick already. Um, Lance McGrew was his crew chief. I can remember talking to Lance at Bowman Gray Stadium. <laughs> he was like out of his element, out of his comfort zone. He said, look, he said, I've never had to size tires. He said, I, Lance had been in the sport. Every tire he's ever touched was a radial. Right. He'd never had to work with a bias pie tire. So they were really, I mean, they – they worked. They worked their tail. I mean, he wasn't. He wasn't bad. I mean, he was competitive. He was. I know. I know what you're talking about because uh, I'd asked him in the previously. Uh, he's like, tires is the hardest thing. I'm. I'm trying to get a grip on. Yeah. And but man, it was. It was. It just goes. It shows you how tough that series was then. And and like I said, and we talked about this early in the going here. That's why all those guys now we're talking about on Sundays. But I think you know Chase was kind of the you know at least during my tenure one of the one of the starts of the younger guys coming and it just, you know, it, it progressed more and more and more or, or regressed if we're going down towards the younger age um, to where now we've got these 12 year olds that come race. But uh, the one thing that I, I've, I've told all of our competitors and anybody that'll listen that really amazed me about the cars tour, and this is both at the pro level and the late, and especially at the late mile stock car level, I'm amazed at how, We'll have 30 cars at, at Tri-County in mm-hmm. here in a couple of weeks. I'm amazed at how close they can race one another, two and three wide, mm-hmm. and do it with respect. Yes, they lean on one another. Yes, they nudge one another. Yes, they the, it, is, it is contact racing, but they're not wrecking each other. You know, we have a little bit more uh, of that that happens at the pro level. Those kids are still learning. They're learning the boundaries of their car. They're learning, you know, where the right front fender is, you know, in relation to the left rear quarter on the car ahead of them. <clears throat> so they're they're having to to learn it, but and it's our responsibility to help them learn it, you know. Um, and, and with actions come consequences. And so, you know, we, um, you know, when I joined on, we we took a long hard look at at, at what to do in the event of. Question for you: Obviously, when you have to give someone a driver a talking to over the years in the past, you've gone up and talked with adults who you can talk with on an adult level. What is, what do you have to do now with talking to someone who is 12? Yeah. You you make sure that you have a family member present. Okay. Why is that? Just from, uh, I just, I'd look at it from a standpoint of, I mean, there are some people who have the mindset that if you're going to race in an adult, in an adult, adult sport you need to be able to handle the consequences like an adult i don't 100 percent subscribe to that it's our job to teach these kids <clears throat> and so i i want i want a parent to come now i will i will respectfully ask, ask the parent you're here i want you to be able to hear what we talk about but you're his parent so just sit there and be the parent right 
that's my other question. Like how fine of a line you have to walk because back in the day you'd talk to an adult driver and that was it. Now you have to talk to a driver and wonder if their parent is going to jump in on you or maybe you have to talk to the parent about something their kid is doing. Yeah. How do you balance that? I don't that? do that. I go right to the kid. Okay. Uh, you know, if we're in the garage and I see a kid and he's, he's had a bad day or something went wrong, you know, I, I, I have no problem going right up to him then. When you go behind that closed door, having the parent there is important. And, and even to the point where maybe that's a, a, a situation where Keely will join me too. We'll make sure that, and not saying that anything is going to go wrong, but in today's society where everybody is, you know, you, you want to make sure that from a, you know, a liability standpoint that you're you're covered on, on all ends, you know. Right. So I invite the parent to come in too. Mm-hmm. But they need to sit there and just be the parent and, and, and let me and the driver talk. Um, and, and to this point, have not had a problem with that. Do you, you find that you've got to give these kids more of a talking to about using the bumper and – because nowadays we are seeing a win at all costs mentality, you know, and I've argued with people on social media about, you know, the, the rubbins racing thing. I mean, I got no problem with cars side by side rubbing on each other, but when one kid goes in the corner and blatantly blasts the, the leader out of the way, and then they say rubbins racing, that's, that's, that's just hitting the guy out of the way. Yeah. Rubbin and wrecking are two different things. Right. Right. So and, I, you know, you and I, we've heard Moody say this. That's a bad line from a terrible or even worse movie or however <laughs> yeah, we it had, goes. We had Dave Moody and he, oh, man, did we catch some crap yeah. talking about this subject, yeah. too. So, so you know, the um, we've and, and since I've been here, I've really only had a couple times where we've had um, the leader get taken out. Um, and we 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 take long as long as we can hard looks at that. You know, I had one driver get to another and. And right hooked him up into the wall. And, you know, that was a stance that we took very seriously and we parked that driver. And then that driver had the next week off. Um, We've had instances where two drivers got super aggressive and second place tried to, tried to bonsai or slide job or whatever the case may be. And it didn't work and ended up wrecking the leader. Well, the guy that did the initiated the wreck, he didn't win either. Um, you know, so you will set down second place if they like a hypothetical situation. S- second place spins the leader coming off a of four to the checkered. Are you giving second place the win? It's it's situational, yeah. right? I mean, so in, in and that's where being an official is tough because where we tried really really hard to make everything as as we try to take the emotion or the subjectivity out of everything. There are certain times that we've got to make a decision. Right. Mm -hmm. And the way that I generally tell folks is that it's, you know, sometimes it's going to be a strike. Sometimes it's going to be a ball. You know, sometimes my zone may not be the same as what you think it ought to be. We see that if everyday Angel Hernandez is behind the plate. So, you know, you've got to be ready for me to make a call. Maybe you don't like the only way that you can make sure that doesn't happen is don't make me make the call. Right, because so, so, we are seeing that more and more in stock car racing. We are we're getting to the point where we're almost anticipating the leader getting moved on the last lap. But you know, I at the cars tour level at both divisions, I don't anticipate that. I mean, I just I, I maybe it maybe I've just come at a right time. And you know, maybe you know, like I said, we've we've I've seen it happen a couple times where we've had to get in the middle of it and make a decision, but I've also seen some great finishes come down to the to the you know right to the start finish line that didn't involve somebody getting wrecked. Right. Um, we we had so Orange County earlier in the year we had uh, a situation we weren't at the end of the race but you know laps were winding down and it was getting aggressive and and Connor Zilich you know got into uh, Bobby McCarty in the center of the corner in three and four and it you know it wrecked four or five cars. Um, it wasn't malicious. It wasn't you know. It, he he didn't go in there with the intention of wrecking him. I don't even think he went there with the intention of, you know, getting into him at all, but they took extremely different lines getting into the corner. And by the time they got to the middle and, and Bobby had taken a higher approach and Connor was almost dominating the corner, mm-hmm. they intersected and, and it didn't turn out good for either one of them. And so, you know, we, we do have a rule that states that if you're involved in a wreck, um, that you're going to the back, mm-hmm. right? And and my definition, and I, we've told the teams this, is that being involved means that you you make contact with a car, 
a car made contact with you or if you spun it all the way around, right? So we had, I think, four or five cars that we identified as being involved in, in that particular wreck. And all of them got moved to the back. Now, a was couple, Connor one of them? Yes. Okay. All right. So, but we had we had we had one of them that was a bystander in all of it, but he was caught up in it. He got he hit two cars and got hit. Right. By definition, by rule, he was involved in it. Right. He was able to continue pretty quickly, um, and they were upset the fact that I put him to the back. And I said, like, look, we I, I kind of spelled this out. And I've got to, I, I want to make sure that, you know, we don't have it, their, their, their argument. And I, I completely understand the argument was that they were able to continue and they, they might've only lost one or two spots. But the one thing that at this level, I don't want to promote, you know, we talked about the blend rule that NASCAR had at the, at the Canaan level, where if you got spun, wherever you blended is where you blended. Mm -hmm. I want to see these guys be able to preserve a race car to take action where they don't crash or possibly get hurt. So if they're able to, if they, if they're able to stop and there's no contact, I'm going to give them their spot back. Mm -hmm. If they're able to get through the mess without making any contract or contact, you know, after the, I'm going to give them their spot back. What I don't want to promote is the blend because in my opinion, at our level that promotes, Oh, well, there's a wreck happening. And I got to get through this or I'm going to lose positions hammer down mm -hmm. because that typically doesn't end very well. Okay. So, so in this instance, you know, we had, like I said, we had one car that, that, you know, they were, they got hit the, the car that hit them got all the way up to the rear and housing and it, it put the hood up, you know, at the windshield of the car that did the hitting and then he hit two cars. So we put him to the back and, you know, we had to agree to disagree on that calling. But I think that, the number one thing that, that we have to do with that scenario and then every scenario now moving forward is to make sure we stay consistent with that. Being a, a race director and having the background that you have with being an official, when you see the Bowman Gray antics, you know, on flow or these guys using their cars as a weapon and they're, they're ramming into each other, what is going through your mind? And if that was you, what would you be doing? I mean, would you be throwing guys out for the night or? Yeah. So, so Bowman Gray and this was. Uh, because here, well, here's the other thing too. I, and I use Bowman Gray because we've seen this type of behavior at this track. Sure. But what we're also seeing too, sometimes you scroll through your Facebook feed and you'll see the same type of incident happen at a track in the Midwest somewhere. And right. Do you think that it's not that great of an idea? Because norm, if you normalize this behavior, people will think that's normal. Yeah. So. Bowman Gray is, is a unique place. Right. Uh, I remember when we took the K and N cars there, I was told by a number of people there that, you know, Bowman Gray does things a little bit differently. And my answer to that was, well, at NASCAR, we do everything the same. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, Hey, I live 15 minutes from there. Um, you know, if I'm home, I'm, I'm going to go on a Saturday, you know, they, they, they try to uh, to to blend the fact that they race there with the fact that there's entertainment, mm -hmm. and so we also, my family and I, we go to um, a lot of hockey games too in Winston Salem, where you know we have a minor league team, the Thunderbirds that play. They are a a very very good hockey team that has players that come in and out of that program quickly, so they're able to rebuild and and have good seasons. So a lot of what goes on in hockey is fighting, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a when you go to Bowman Gray, you see a little bit of the hockey mentality that, you know, you've you've pushed my goalie around one or two times, so now we're gonna we're gonna drop our gloves and go at it. Um the hard part that I the part that I struggle with at Bowman Gray is the fact that using a, you know, a twenty five hundred pound race car as, as the weapon or as your fist, uh, or getting out and having a full on brawl, um that's just, that's to me, that's not ideal. Um, I, you know, we all know that when, uh, you get a driver that gets out and stomps on the air cleaner of another modified, or you get a driver that gets out and goes and confronts whoever crashed into him and he grabs onto the, the B post and gets drug around the racetrack, which is crazy. Yeah. I mean, but, but you know, that to that point, 
the that uh, keeps fans coming back and at the almighty dollar and then the fans coming back in there. But you know, I man, I know those guys too. You know those guys, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so it's just uh yeah, Bowman Gray's just a little bit different. I, I I'm so nervous that they are gonna have an instance one night where something like that gets way out of hand and they're not able to corral it and then racing as we've known it at Bowman Gray goes away. That's what scares me more than anything. Um, that, you know, you, you know, there's there's not a lot of catch fencing around that place. Right. Fans can hop over those walls. And 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 what worries me is that you'll have as passionate as those fans are, you know, all of a sudden somebody's driver gets done wrong. What's gonna stop seventeen thousand fans from jumping down on the football fields like a bench clearing brawl at a baseball game? I know. I, I, I just you know, things like that and I think about it. I saw a streaker there one night. In the middle of a caution, come out. He came out. He come running across the track, all bare assed. It would not surprise me at all. <laughs> at Bowman Gray, would guy. not surprise me. At all. It was the funniest thing. But, uh, but for you though, obviously, racing. We're here to put on a show. Yeah. But where do you have a line of what is racing and what is entertainment? Um, I think the racing should be the entertainment. Um, that's why, that's why I think the competition cautions are important. That's why I think that, you know, our guys racing side by side and being able to do it without wrecking one another is important. Obviously, um, that should be the entertainment that gets me up on the edge of my seat, but I've been, I watch races probably a little differently than most. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, the strategy for me is entertainment. Um, but I watch races a little differently than most. Um, I'd much rather see, you know, strategy coming to play or good side by side racing for lap after lap after lap versus wrecks happening on the racetrack. Because I also understand that wrecks cost money. And and I hate it when I hate going down on a Saturday night after a race into the pit area and see a bunch of race cars that you you're looking at all these body panels that have got to be straightened out or replaced. Right. Right. Or a rear clip that's got to get fixed. Or whatever the case may be, because I, I, I understand that these guys, a lot of them, they, they scrape to get to the racetrack, right? One of the things that I thought was neat one time, I think it was at Greenville. We were at Greenville, and it was one of those demolition derby K&N races. And I think the next week, I forgot where we had to be. It may have been Tri-County. I, I, I don't remember. But in the driver's meeting, you stood up in front of everyone and said, okay, boys, are you tired? He's like, hey, yeah, and guys are nodding. You're like, yeah, you should be after all the work you had to put in on those cars this week. I yeah. mean, like, it, I thought that was cool in the perspective of the way you put it to those guys. Because nowadays with the way that the the cars are, they're so expensive. And the beating and the banging, and, and I'm amazed that they're doing this much beating and banging as expensive as these cars are now. I would expect it 20 or 30 years ago when they didn't cost as much, but now you've got... Now you've got late models that are getting into the six figures. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're there yet as far as that money goes. I mean, they're they're you're right. It's it's expensive. I, I often get tickled at folks who talk about inexpensive racing or trying to make racing inexpensive. It's it's not. I mean, it's and it's it's not going to be. Now you we need all we all need to be aware of of how expensive it is and do our best to try to help contain that. Certainly not spend any more. Um, and at the same time, not throw away money that's already spent. We know that's we talk about rule changes all the time. And um, you know, I come into a series that's been that's been going for you know seven or eight, eight or nine years, and some of the rules that they've got are are different than late model rules that are you know at, maybe at the weekly track. And difference, okay. I mean, we'd like for everything to to try to stay the same. But the one thing that I've really fought hard for for our guys is that. We're not going to change rules just because someone else has this rule that might cause our guys to throw parts away. Mm -hmm. um, money spent is hey, I don't, I don't want to throw stuff away they've already got. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, too, I don't expect you know any of the weekly racers to come and change their rules to come and and have to spend money um, to do what we do. It's okay to be different in those regards, but you know you talk about you know the the racing and the wrecking again. I, I will still say that. Watching our guys at the at the car store level, they're not they're not wrecking each other. They're not slamming into each other. They're mm -hmm. they're leaning on each other. They are they're racing each other hard. Um, but I still think, for the most part, 
man, they're doing some damn good racing. And, and, and every now and again, if we have someone that, that maybe needs to, you know, be corralled in a little bit and talk to a little bit, then we're going to have that discussion too. And, you know, the one thing through all of that, that, and we, we touched on this on the Balma Gray topic, but the one thing that scares me, um, and, and we had this happen one time for us last year, um, knock on wood, we haven't had it happen this year. And I hope that we don't is when, is when tempers do flare and you look down on pit road. And now instead of two race car drivers arguing, it's not just the crew, you know, at the cup level, everybody talks about, let the drivers talk, let the drivers do what they need to do. Keep the crew members out of it. Mm -hmm. And when you get to the weekly level or you get to the short track level, now it's the crew members and it's every bystander that's down there. There was one race at, at a short track last year, late last year, where there was a fight on pit road and in the through the pan of the of the image I see, there's like a grandma grandmother and a grandfather kind of walking through the the melee and they're looking on and they're I'm like at, at what point are, are we gonna have to have someone's grandparents hurt before we put our foot down on this? So, you know, my my stance on on fighting in the pits anymore. Hopefully I don't have to go down this path. But if you if you find it important enough to walk down and be a part of that area. Even if you're not throwing punches, um, you probably can expect a penalty from us. I, I'm just, you know, I'm going to, I, I'm all for the drivers talking it out. I'm all for a driver being upset and, you know, getting no, I mean, the Boma gray can in race Bubba and Brett Moffat nose to nose. <laughs> oh yeah. But they weren't going to fight. I know they were arguing. They were arguing, and then you know, of course, you Bubba know. almost got arrested too because he put his hands on the cop. Remember well, that? Because but, they were in each other's face, and the cop had both hands up, and then Bubba smacked the guy, the cop's hand away. And the second yeah. that happened, you saw the switch on the cop, and he got right in Bubba's face, like you don't touch me. And we we got we had to get in the middle of that too because of the fact that we we had to remind them that hey, these these guys are our guys. They're not going to fight, and and. And the reason that the cop got in the middle of us was Bubba reached up and grabbed Brett's helmet. Yeah. Right. And so, I mean, but they were, I mean, you know, the cop didn't know, but at the same time too, you know, it, I, we, we had to diffuse that situation between the, the, the local police and, mm -hmm. and our guys. And, you know, it, it could have been much, much worse. Thankfully it wasn't. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I just think that, you know, if, if you know, hopefully we don't, um, but, we all know how passion is and we know how all know how tempers can, can spark in a heartbeat. And we know that people, Hey, if my buddy's done there, he's in trouble. I'm gonna go help him. We know that mentality, mm -hmm. but we're going to approach that from a standpoint of, if you feel the need to go down there and be a part in it, be a part of that situation in any way, you can probably expect some penalties to come out of it. The cars tour is so competitive. I mean, we are seeing these development teams now who are grooming the next drivers to go up to the next level. We are seeing late models on seven post rigs. They're showing up in stacker, 18 wheeler trailers, you know, things like that. Is there any room left anymore for the Saturday night racer to compete with the cars tour? I mean, there's just so much technology and so many resources now. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think there is, um, you know, the, the one thing that, that we need to kind of remember too, is that, you know, if you're a hobbyist, if you're, if you're, if you're someone that is just racing just for the sheer fun of it, you're, you're probably not going on a tour. You're probably going to race at your local track. And that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to support those local tracks. Um, but you know, at the cars tour level, you know, the, we, we do have several teams that, you know, have developmental programs, you know, Junior Motorsports has had a team in the Cars Tour since the inception of. I mean, even back in the Pro Cup days, they had a they had a team. You know, that's where you know Josh Berry and and those guys came from, right? right. Yep. And you know, KHI now has a couple of cars. Um, Lee Pulliam has has cars, and he's he's a he's working with Toyota. We we've, we've got teams that are are working with those OEMs that are trying to find that next next driver, right? And so, but I still think that, you know, we still have several teams that, that roll in there that, you know, they're, they're in a smaller trailer. Well, I mean, the junior motorsports team, they're in goosenecks. They're in regular goosenecks like you'd see at a Saturday night track. The Harvick team is too. And, 
you know, uh, Lee's team is that way. Marcus Richmond's teams are are that way. They're in the small trail. We do have a few teams that have the big tractor trailers. We're actually seeing those kind of phase out a little bit more and more. And trailers don't win races. Well, they don't. And in some of the places we go, uh, you know, we want to be mindful of the track. We want to be mindful of sight lines that, you know, might be, you know, uh, tough to see over these big, I mean, even we're, we're going the route of getting, we have a tractor trailer that we haul our inspection equipment in and, and we we're going the route now of, of getting into goosenecks. And, and that way we're not, we're not being that hypocrite that says you got to move your big truck. Oh, but our big truck's going to stay inside. Okay. So, okay. Okay. So, um, so at any rate, you know, they're there. I think that, you know, what I see when, when they're not spending the money on the great big truck and trailer, they're probably spending it somewhere else, you know? Oh, teams always do. That's right. <laughs> you, That's right. Team, you never spend, you never save money in racing because the team yes. will always find a way to take that money and put it somewhere else. That's right. That, that's the thing. Um, but your job now, I mean, you have bosses with names like Harvick, Burton, Earnhardt. What is it like working for just some of those huge names, Hall of Fame names and future Hall of Fame names? Yeah, but the, the, the thing I learned in the early going is, man, they are racers. They love racing. They... We text each other, whether individually or in a, we've got a group, a group chat that goes on daily. They, they wake up thinking about what can we do to make the cars tour better? What can we do to make the experience for the racer better? Um, you know, they're, they're constantly being mindful of, you know, how are ways maybe we can reapply, you know, plan money to go into prize money? How can we make it better for the middle of the pack towards the back and not so weighted at the front uh, when it comes to payouts? They, they are, they are extremely sincere about wanting to make sure that this level of racing not only survives, but thrives. Um, I think when they got involved, when they, when they heard that, that, you know, Jack was looking for someone to, to take the series and, and and make sure that it, it keeps on keeping on. Well, they jumped at the chance to to do that, but then then make it grow. But then we have to be mindful of the fact that we don't need to grow beyond the the footprint that we have, right? We don't need to I mean the, the longest pull, and if you use Mooresville kind of as the central as the hub, the longest pull that we have is to Dominion Raceway. Okay. Up in Virginia. Well, you guys didn't I see that you guys are starting a a, a Cars West tour. So also? yeah, that's that's a little different, and 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 I'll touch on that. The, but in talking about not making sure that we don't grow bigger than 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 kind of where we are now, mm -hmm. we don't want to have more races. We feel like that you know we run eighteen events, uh, seventeen late model stocks, and I think it was thirteen pro races. Um, if you if you grow that schedule much more than that, then you're, you're really stretching the teams thin. Um, we have to be mindful of that, you know, and that's what makes this past weekend at, or this past couple of days at Wilkesboro, you know, really kind of hurt worse is the fact that, you know, they're most of them are blue collar nine to five workers. So, you know, when we have those midweek races, it, it, it causes them to have to take vacation. So of course, you know, every time we have a midweek race, we, we sometimes will have a, a pretty big name that'll join us. So every, obviously every track now wants a midweek race. Um, so we, we be, we're mindful of that. And so we, the areas that we want to make sure that we grow is just an exposure, whether it's through flow or, or through, you know, just being able to be in front of more people at the racetracks, you know, maybe, you know, take a look at down the road where we are not going to, um, you know, maybe, as as tracks kind of change throughout the you know the course of the schedules, try to visit maybe a few more tracks, but still within our footprint. As tracks, maybe they don't want two dates, or maybe they can't have two dates, or or whatever whatever their situation might be. Rather than adding second dates at a lot of places, maybe we try to find a new track to go to. Which that's another topic that's becoming tougher and tougher to do because tracks are falling by the wayside. Um, but the west the West Coast tour, you know, you, you ask about that. Um, Tim Huddleston, um, and if you've been around the, the the West Coast part of racing, and and since I was with the Canaan West for a number of years, I got to know you know Tim Huddleston and the race car factory, and and all that he did was with 
helping racers get into race cars, whether they're, he had a junior program out there at one point in time. Um, but Huddleston's now involved with Irwindale, with uh, Kern County. And of course, you know, one of our owners, you know, Kevin Harvick is from Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. So Kevin, Kevin jumped out there and wanted to make sure that, you know, the racing that went on out there stayed healthy as well. Mm -hmm. So the association that we have with Car Store West is 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 one of pr of promotion um is is we're going to help them from a standpoint of we're offering them some technical you know like we're sharing rules um but they're not quite at a place where they're ready to fully adopt our rules um because they don't have late model stocks out there right no they, but they a have a lot of them are they have a variation of the pro okay because I, I as i always thought you know everything out there is like the straight rail offset type which is modeling. which is a pro. So okay. so they have a variation of that. They're still not quite to the level of the race car that our pro is. You mm -hmm. know, they run a different tire, a different. I don't even think it's a different brand. I think it's a different. Um, it's a different size. But you know, a number of things that, that are different for them. Um, but the one thing that we are able to do is, you know, like I said, from a naming standpoint, you know, really help promote them and and help give them the the little oomph that they need when they're trying to. Uh, to, to draw people to come watch their races. I, I think the racers are out there and they all wanted to get together to race. And, and Tim was eager to, to, to get a tour put together. And so, you know, Kevin was able to go out there and, and put together a pretty good package for him. Cool. What about bigger stages? Like, you know, when we were in K&N, we went to places like Bristol, Richmond, Dover. Has there ever been any talks in taking the car store, maybe to a place like Bristol, a, a half a mile, or Richmond? Richmond would be great, too. Yeah, so so they've run at Bristol before. Um, they were part of that short track uh, national right. mm -hmm. that they did. Man, Bristol's just tough on a car like a late mile stock. I mean, from a suspension standpoint, you remember when we took the modifieds there? Oh, yeah. Everything that had to be done to beef that car up to be able to handle the loads to the corners there. So I mean, when you do that, you're just talking money. Mm -hmm. I, and I think the novelty of going to Bristol is 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 a is a cool thing. Um, but you know, we've we've talked with um, a number of the of the national you know venues, and it just uh, you know from a standpoint of opening up their doors to if it's not already a part of a weekend where they're open it's so expensive to open those tracks. Yeah. Um, you, you know, it's not, you know, you go to, you go to Caraway Speedway, you know, it's a, it's a half dozen people that are, you know, running that place. And, and so to open the gate there for us to come race is far less expensive than the hundreds that you have to bring to open up a, a larger venue like that. So, so we've had those discussions. It, the, the timing of all that has to be right. You know, the timing of the North Wilkesboro, event as the track was revived, you know, and the car store had a big part of the revival, even before the all-star race was announced to go there last year. Um, the car store was, was, was huge in that regard. Um, and so, you know, we feel like that, you know, now with our association with Z max, with Marcus Smith, with, with the group at Speedway Motorsports, you know, um, we, we feel like we've got a, a good home for our big event to be at North Wilkesboro. So running all-star week was you know, if the weather would have cooperated, it would have been big for us. Mm -hmm. Crowning our champs there in October, that's going to be huge for us too because we'll be able to do it on a stage that is ha has that national flair to it. That was going to be my next question was from a logistical standpoint or operational standpoint, is there anything that changes for you guys when, say, Kevin Harvick or Dale Jr. races with you guys because you know the, the crowds are going to be huge and the autograph lines and, and all of that? Yeah. It, yeah, from the from the inside of the track, um, and, and and I divide the track in halves, right? So there's the infield, everything inside the perimeter of the catch fence, <clears throat> and everything on the outside is the the outfield, so to speak. So on on the infield side of the track, nothing changes, um, and they are adamant about that. You know, just because they're there, we do our jobs the way we're supposed to. You know, we. It's like, you remember when you were in school and the substitute teacher would come or there'd be an administrator in the back of the room and everybody would shape up or they would, or they'd act crazy. You know, we, we expect our, whether it's our officials or our teams, we expect them to, to act at a high level all the time. And it doesn't matter if Dale shows up and he does, he just, he just wants to be another racer, you know, same for, same for Kevin and. Um, and, and, and it's not uncommon for them to, you know, even if they're not racing to maybe show up. Right. And so we just need to 
do what we do all the time when they're there. Now on the on the track side, on the outfield side, they you know the tracks will they'll plan for you know maybe added security, maybe added you know parking staff. You know when Dale went with us to uh, to New River, you know that was by that was a happy accident there because you know we had weather that caused us to have to postpone that race to a, a, a date later on the calendar. And it was a date that Dale was free. So he was able to come run. And of course, you know, they made the announcement he was coming. And so the track, you know, they prepped up for it. They brought in some stands. They, they added what they could, but they had no idea that the amount of people that would show up. I think they, you know, they, on a great night, they probably seat, you know, 1200, 1500 people. You know, now they had 15,000. Wow. And they said that they, they had to stop letting people come in at 15,000. So, you know, they, they know that from, uh, you know, ingress, egress uh, issue, they, they had some problems that they're, fortunately, none of them, you know, really popped up, but they, they had to plan for that a little bit. But isn't that such an important bridge, though, because you just said it right there. They went from, you know, 1,500 people in the stands to 15,000. Don't you think we need more guys doing that at the short track level? Because in the last couple of years, you know, we've seen that separation of the higher and the upper levels because we aren't seeing many local heroes going to the top tiers. Yeah. How important is it to have that bridge? Um, it's, it's, it's important for sure. Um, but, you know, the, the other part of that is, remembering that those guys that maybe run every Sunday, they run every Sunday. And so to ask them to maybe on a weekend or a midweek that they might have off to spend with family, mm -hmm. you know, their, their time's precious to them too. You know, Dale, Dale, you know, he tries to set his schedule that, you know, for some of the races that he, he loves to go to, he don't, he wants to go to racetracks that have high tire wear and, and you have to, you know, have some tire strategy and take care of a race car. So, you know, that's where New River came into play. He, he, that was a bucket list race for him, and he, he loved going there. Um, Florence is another track that he loves to go to with the same, you know, similar characteristics there. Um, uh, he's, he's planning on, um, you know, he's uh, going to come and race with us down there as well. Uh, he's got some other races that he's got on the calendar that, that you know, people will find out about as we move forward. You know, but we do, you know, we have some opportunities coming up um, in the in the future on the car store schedule, you know, where where we might see a name or two that, um, you know, it has has some cup notoriety. We had we had um, at North Wilkesboro, if we'd have been able <laughs> if we'd been able to race, we had, you know, Sammy Smith out of the JRM stables mm -hmm. who was racing one of his cars. We had Josh Berry that was running with us. We had. Um, you know, Brandon Jones was running with us. We had, we had some of the guys that, you know, had a weekend off, whether it's a, a, with, from the Xfinity or, or with, with Josh, Josh will come run with us whenever he has an opportunity to, you know, now, you know, being a part of Stuart Haas, he's obviously got a tie now with Harvick and, and so they put together a car for him to come run, run there. And he's a past champ too. I mean, that, that, that goes a long, long way. So right. I think that we, we are going to see, our fair share of, of those big name guys come and run with us. And, you know, we had, uh, Kyle Larson come and run with us last year at the July racing care at Caraway. And it was a, it was a last minute decision. Uh, they were able to put the car together for him. And I mean, they didn't even, there were n the only graphics for that were on the car. They ran a Hendrix, uh, Hendrick cars.com, um, you know, sponsored car. It was just the logo, right? No rap, numbers no numbers and just, letters. And that was it. Yeah, that was it. So it was extremely <laughs> last minute. Uh, but, you know, the track was able to get the word out through social, you know, uh, avenues. We were able to get the word out, too, that he was coming. And and so, uh, you know, it, it brought quite a few people there. And and to their credit, to Kyle's credit, and, and anybody that shows up, Dale is a, a, a big advocate of this. They slow down and they take the time to, to, to interact with the fans. You know, they, they're there to have fun and be a racer. Um, but when when we finished the race at New River and Dale was there, um, one of the coolest things that I got to see was, you know, after a, a large majority of the crowd had left and Dale's just sitting out on the pit wall and there's probably, I don't know, a dozen fans that are just sitting out there shooting the breeze. They weren't looking for photos or autographs or they were just shooting the bull. They were bench racing with one of the greatest racers, greatest, you know, personalities that we've, we've had in our sport, 
I mean, he to see him at that reminded me so much of the king sticking around to sign autographs until every last one. He just hung around to drink a beer with everybody. Um, you it's, know. it's that, and it's that connectivity too, because that dozen or so people yep. are going to walk away remembering that for ever the, the rest of the <laughs> yeah forever. Yep. We are getting closer to the end of the show, but before we go, you know, stories uh, always drive the the show here. We always love hearing a funny and interesting story. Have you got any uh, interesting or funny ones over the years? Yeah, so you know the the a lot of pace car stories, right? That happened in just a very very short period of time. You know, one of the one of the coolest um, guests that we had driving the pace car was Chip Gaines. You know, Chip and Joanna Gaines. They have their their uh, I don't remember the name of their home improvement show. Magnolia now. Network. Yeah. Right? yeah. So my, I only say that because my wife loves HGTV yeah. and all those those house shows. Well, you can tell her that Chip and Joanna, what what she sees on TV is exactly how they are in real life. Oh, they, about busting on each other? It is hilarious. <laughs> Chip shows up to drive. He's the honorary driver at Texas one year. And so we go out to do the training. Well, in the middle of the training, Chevrolet is giving rides to VIPs. And so, and and I was helping out with that too. And generally when we give rides around the racetrack, you're going about 100, right, to give them a little sense of speed. And But the other drivers that were driving uh, during that weekend was Terry Labonte, and Ryan Newman. And they were probably, I'm sure, going well above 100. So we're out there making laps, and then the time comes for Chip to show up. So those two keep giving rides, and Chip's watching them go around, and he's like, man, this is going to be awesome. So we get he, we get him in the car, and I'm like, man, your training starts right now. He said, how fast do we get to go? I said, 45 miles an hour. <laughs> he said, you're, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> no, sir, 45 miles an hour. Yeah. So – we get out there, and sure enough, I make him set the cruise. We're in a Camaro uh, ZL1. That I mean, it's it's a Corvette with a Camaro body on it, right? Yeah. And we're out there, and he's like, Terry and Ryan are just flying by us, and he he just can't stand it. And so, but he does his training at forty five, and so we put him in the car with Terry, so Terry could could uh, give him a good ride. And so, um, and while we did that, I, I put uh, Joanna and the kids in my car to give them a ride too, and. So we're going around a racetrack and, you know, we're up around a hundred and, um, Terry and Ryan were right up along the outside wall, riding the high line. And Joanna said, why are you way down here at the bottom instead of up there at the wall? And I said, ma'am, I said, if they skin one of these cars up, they can probably handle the damages. <laughs> if I skin one of these cars up, it's probably a bus ticket home and never be able to do this again. And I really like what I do. Right. I like my job. That's right. <laughs> that's great. Oh my. And that, that's the other thing too, that I found funny that uh, when you were the pace car driver for the cup series, setting the cruise control is, was a way of it's critical. Setting your pace, right? It's, it's a tool, right? I mean, it's... So the cruise control in the car is the pace setter for the field. That's exactly right. No kidding. And, we, and, we, and those are calibrated every week, uh -huh. every race. And I mean, you, it's the same pair of Chevrolets that show up or the same pair of Camrys or the same pair of Mustangs. It's the same. Those cars are, are shipped to each track. But we would calibrate those pace cars to the transponder. We'd put a transponder on the car. And we would go down pit road at the pit road speed to make sure the speed we were running matched the speed that timing and scoring was seeing up in, in race control. And we would do that all the time. So, so you almost have to run a time trial lap for the pace car. We would, so we'd get out there and we would, <laughs> we would on, on Thursday or Friday of the weekend, we would get out there and we'd make laps and we'd calibrate all the vehicles. Now, if, and if it was a Toyota track where we had all three divisions there, we had a pair of Camrys, a pair of Supers, and a pair of Tundras that we had to do that for every one of them. We also would calibrate the chase trucks. Um, that way, if we were in the middle of a race and we had a malfunction, and the pace truck then became, or the chase truck then became a pace vehicle, we wanted to make sure that they were calibrated correctly too. But we would get out there, and and, and it was never more uh, evident that that one tool was so important than we were at Daytona one year. And we had a brand new set of pace vehicles, and I'm not going to out the OEM on this one, but we had a brand new set of pace vehicles. And when we got up on the bank, the vehicle's brain, because vehicles are smarter than people now, the vehicle's brain thought that the it was going to turn over. 
and so it shut off all the extracurricular features on this on this vehicle. No kidding. No more cruise control because of the the extreme banking. Yes. No. Did the OnStar click on or anything? I'm not going to out any OEM. <laughs> So, so, but, but we noticed and where it really became evident was when during the, we knew that, Hey, this is, we're in, we've made this bed, we're in it. But when we were going down the back stretch one time under one of the cautions, I looked down, I'm running 90. And at Daytona, the pace speed is seven or the, the caution speed is 70. Mm -hmm. And then you're going down the next lap and you're running 55. Because as you're looking for debris or you're looking for fluid or you're trying to tell the tower where something is to go and pick up or address, you need to, you know, you, you lose track of what speed you're running. And I look in the mirror and the accordion behind me is just crazy because I, I wasn't able to maintain that speed. So, I mean, that's that, that weekend right there proved the fact that cruise control was so important to make sure that it works. How many cup drivers have... Uh, hit you in the back bumper. So <laughs> there's one that's pretty famous because he hit me after he spun because of wet weather and he was angry. And when he hit me, he knocked the bumper cover off the car. And so that was at New Hampshire, you know, Kyle and Kyle Bush. And I think Denny and there's one more. It was kind of ironic that it were all Joe Gibbs cars that crashed getting into one. And Kyle was mad. And so he came up and he hit me and I told him, I said, man, I just, I wish you would have just wrecked me. It would have made a lot better story. <laughs> and he said, he said, you know, I could have if I don't want it to, <laughs> we had it. So, uh, but I'll tell you this, he and I both learned a lot in the following weeks. Yeah. He learned that when I'm sitting at wherever I'm parked on the racetrack, it's a different view than what they're seeing when they're driving at a hundred and whatever miles an hour. If I'm watching the mist, and, and what happened at New Hampshire that weekend is, if you've ever been to a like a football game where you see the the dew settle, mm -hmm. and suddenly the football field is covered in this glaze, it put, and you only realized it because you could see the footprints. Mm -hmm. The dew settled, getting into one and two fast enough that it put a glaze over this racetrack. It wasn't raining, it wasn't raining. It was like a heavy mist, mm -hmm. and. Every time I'd wipe the window, I was I would wipe the window with the wipers to see how fast the mist was falling. What I learned is that I shouldn't have wiped the window because the accumulation is what I should have been focusing on more than the speed that it was coming down. Because if it was accumulating on my window, it was accumulating on the racetrack. Okay. Now, this this other part, remember later on that year, I believe we were at Daytona and it rained over in one and two, but nowhere else on the racetrack. Mm -hmm. Well, it got everybody up in arms too because we should have seen it. We should have known it. It rained in literally in one spot at the track and nowhere else. We didn't have a chance to see it. And it, obviously a couple of cars wrecked. I think it's, that was the July race that um, I think uh, Austin Dillon ended up winning. Yeah, I, th I, th I think I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. And again, that comes back to the stuff that we talked about. Like you can't factor weather like because it's just no, weather happens. Can't. So, but man, it, it's been great having you here today. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, before we go, uh, is there anything you want to plug? Let us know what's going on with the Cars Tour, how we can find the Cars Tour, the next race, you know, That's all right. that stuff. Yeah, so we're at Tri-County Speedway here in a couple of weeks. Um, great track. It's a great track. Yeah. And you know, then the, the Higgins family that that operate that track, every time we show up, they've done something new. You know, they, they've, over the course of the last handful of years, they repaid the turns and they repaid the straightaways. They added a new LED light system. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that is a, 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 driver or a crew member favorite they went in and they 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 raised the elevation of of what they've done in the restrooms so now the restrooms are nice and clean every time you go there i mean that's it's the little things like that but every time that we show up they do something a little bit different something that's new mm -hmm. and so that is that is a great testament of a short track that that puts the money right back into the track but you know we've got you know, other races coming up on the calendar. We go to Langley Speedway to go up and see Bill Mullis and Chuck Hall and that group up there. They've always treated us great. When Absolutely. We've been there over yep. the years. Yeah, yeah, the seafood up there is to die for. I know, right? That spread that they put out for That's us. That's right. The TV so. crew. The, we we ate great every year we went up there. Yep. 
But listen, I, I want to thank you for coming in today. Uh, I really do, because I always appreciated what you did for us. You always gave the our TV guys the you know the respect and the uh, due. I, I loved know. going out and being able to sit in a truck with Tim every now and again just to kind of see what goes on. Yeah, and you were you were always cool with us. Whenever we needed to talk to somebody or work with us for post-race, you guys were right there. Yeah. So I appreciate that. I definitely appreciate the years that we've been friends. And uh, good luck with the Cars Tour this season and in the coming years, because I know – you're just going to do great things with that, like you did with all the other series you've worked with. Now, DP, anytime you want to sit down and talk about racing, you know I'm your guy. Oh, believe me, we'll have you back because I know that there's more stories and stuff we never even got to touch on in, in my notes. So, Perfect. But thank you. You got it. Kip Childress from the Z-Max Cars Tour joins us in the Derek Pernasiglio Show. Remember to follow us on all of our social media channels, the Derek Pernasiglio Show on Facebook and on YouTube. Click that like and subscribe button down below. You can also follow us at Real DP Show on X. Everyone knows it as Twitter. And of course, on Instagram, at Real DP Show. And we're also on TikTok now. So check out the TikTok channel, Real DP Show as well. So for Kip Childress, I'm Derek Pernasiglio saying thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you the next time. Bye.